step. God's reading to us this morning I've chosen to use from Galatians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of God, our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. About your bulletin, or menu, or whatever it is, I was told that there is one change in it, and that is about the ladies' Bible study. That's not this week, it's the following week. And we men will be trying to gather together also at that same time. And I more or less got the first one worked out, and I'll try and tell you about that next week. But after that, I will be asking for input from you men that will be attending as to what we should be, where we should be going, what we should be doing. On the back side of your bulletin are two prayers. I was looking and it was thinking very much about this this service this morning and where we are in terms of our national politics. And with everything happening Tuesday, our election and things, I found these two prayers. One is from the New Hope Baptist Church at Zeblin, Georgia, although I first saw it I think it was on uh, Day Spring, a section there. And then the second one is by Pastor Joe Wright, and he delivered it before a session of the Kansas State Legislature in 1996. It was later read by Paul Harvey, and he said it was the largest, he got the largest response to that of any program he'd ever done. It was also attributed to Billy Graham, but it actually came from Mr. Wright. And I understand that it caused quite a commotion in the Kansas legislature after he offered this prayer. But those were two prayers that I thought fit our time. Call to worship this morning. I've chosen to use what I saw, Phil showed me, Pastor John's Facebook entry. I don't know if it was this week or last week, week before. Anyway, he was talking about Psalm chapter 20, and he especially emphasized verse 7. We trust, others, some people trust in horses and in chariots but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Let's have a time of silent prayer, please. Father, we thank you for all the ways that you have blessed America, this country that you allowed us the privilege and the honor of living in and being a part of. You've blessed us with independence. You've blessed us with so many other things. We just thank you for that. As we approach Tuesday, we would ask that your will will be done. Where we're reminded of how the Israelites in the wilderness and at other times yelled for, clamored for, 
complained about different things and how you sent them, gave them their request. But it says in the scripture, you gave them leanness of soul. So at this time in our election, in our national life, we want your will Lord, whatever happens, we know that you know about it already in advance. We just ask that you will work out your sovereign will in this situation. We ask that after whatever happens, that you'll give us the grace to accept that and to believe you are at work. I ask this in your name for your sake and honor and glory. Our first hymn is number 322, I Need Thee Every Hour, verses 1, 2, 3, and 5, and then verse 4, please. Were there other announcements this morning that any of you have? I should have asked about that. None? Do 
Deuteronomy 6, beginning in verse 4, a familiar passage for us. Uh, what we call the Shema. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Achad. Vachavta eth Adonai Eloheka, Bechol Lavavka, Ubechol Nafshika, Ubechol Meodika. Vachayu ha Devarim, Hailesh Asher Anoki. Metzavacha hayom alevavcha. Veshinantam, lavecha, vedebarta, bam, beshevka, bevetka, uvelekteka, vedeka, uvesh, uv shachvecha, uv humecha, uk chertam, la ot, al yarecha. Bahayu le totafo ben enenka Uchtavtam al mezuzot etecha u vesherecha. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk, walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Continue. Uh, our time on congregational prayer this morning, and I will pass the mic around. Um, I know it seems a little monotonous, but um, still continue prayers for Grand Monte. Um, not exactly sure where the numbers are yet. I kind of lost track since Friday, um, but unfortunately, one of those is my dad. Um, so. Um, so far, what they can tell me is everybody that has been diagnosed um, positive um, is manageable. Um, there hasn't been any you know, huge symptoms by anybody, but they're testing about every day, and um, yesterday, even after Dad tested positive in the morning, they had two more. So, um, And also, because of that, where they're having the um, confinement area, um, is right on the floor and in the area where mom's room is at. And so now it's just a matter that dad has to stay in his room and she has to stay in her room with her door closed because all the rooms surrounding her have positive cases. Um, it's just a little bit too much to move and it was up to her and she decided to stay in her room with her door closed. So, um, so yeah, so the time has come that I didn't want to see, but um, continue prayers for everybody. Absolutely. Any other news? Phyllis. My brother Charlie uh, is in the hospital. Um, they say he's holding his arm at some some of the uh, symptoms are better and some are worse, so continue to be prayer for him. Thursday, I'll be going to Mason City for my cancer surgery on the nose. And I want to pray for the doctors and the pathology lab. And whatever has to be done, I will accept. Thank you. Certainly, prayers for the election. You've already kind of prayed that this morning, Dale, but uh, certainly the events uh, coming up this week. And then number two is our council meeting. We have a council meeting, and there are decisions to make as the uh, days and months and weeks come forward. Just, um, yeah, there's still a lot of uncertainty. So, prayers for council meeting. 
I want to brighten things up a little bit with the praise. Um, this past week at Awana, I worked with a little a young man, probably fifth or sixth grade, and he gave a testimony of how he shared Jesus with a friend and tried to convince him that Jesus is real and true. And I just that just blessed my heart. So there's there's some positives out there with uh, the training of our youth. Do you want to do the honors? <laughs> I'll let you. I'll let you take. He and I are having a little fun about him getting to set as just one of us, and that is good. We are glad that he is able to do that today. Phyllis asked if that would bother me. Probably should be asking you if it bothers you that I and Dale are in your congregation. <laughs> but anyway, no, I'm just, Norm is here worshiping with us this morning. He's just one of our, one of you people, one of us this morning. Go with me to prayer, please. I invite you to come to prayer. I will be using part of the prayer from, I gotta see, it's out of the uh, red book. Uh, anyway, it's on one of those morning prayer sessions there. I'll use part of that. Father, you heard our, our requests, the ones that we've made audible and others that we have not. It's hard for us to see the new developments of COVID, like with Karen being confined to her closed room and the things that are going on there at Grand Valley and other places like that. So Lord, we lift them up. We have Along that line, we have Matt and Cindy and John and Clint and Phil's brother Charles and others, Lord, that we know of and are familiar with. We pray for them, pray for those who are taking care of them. Rachel's surgery, we pray, as she is asking for the doctor, we pray for that. The coming election. Lord, we give this into your hands. Do I also ask that we pray for the council meeting Tuesday night also? So we do lift the members of the council up. I think as at the first of the year as they are sworn into office, we are asked as a congregation whether we will support them in prayer and encouragement. We don't want to just do that just this one time. We want to do that regularly, but we do this morning lift up our council. Thank you for each of them. Be with their meeting Tuesday night. Give them wisdom, give them guidance, give them your direction. And Jan has had a testimony and she has told us, shared with us, that there are positives even in this time. <clears throat> so we thank you for that, that testimony of that child. Hear your people, Lord. Bless them as they do praise you and live for you and show that their lives are for you. We pray for our country. We pray for those who frame our laws and those who keep the peace and administer justice. We pray for those who rebuild where things have been destroyed, for those who fight hunger and poverty and disease. We pray for those who teach, those who heal, and all who serve our communities. We pray for people in need, those for whom life is a, a bitter struggle, 
those whose lives are clouded by death and loss, or by pain or disability, by discouragement or fear, by shame or rejection. In each of these things, Lord, we pray that your kingdom will come, that your will will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you that Norm is able, Pastor Norm is able to be here this morning worshiping just as one of us. Thank you for giving him this opportunity to do that. We pray for the pastoral family. We just ask that you will bless each of them. Thank you for Jasmine and I hope that she is to Norm. Help us all to be more of an encouragement to them. In your name we ask and pray. Amen. A couple of notes about the message this morning before I actually get going with it. You have already seen where the scripture is. It's from Philippians chapter 4 verse 2 to 9. Phyllis has, for a long time, has had it. one of those little embroidered, I think it is, uh, sayings, and it's uh, uh, this of Philippians, uh, chapter 4, verse 8. Another thing that happened about why this message was chosen, though, was that an author that I enjoy reading recently wrote you know how authors do as a postscript or something like that. Well, she she did a postscript and she said that basically she was having problems being thankful and being in gratitude, uh, gratitude spirit. She said that she was complaining a lot, and somebody sent her an email and suggested that she should practice instant gratitude, and she is suggesting that through her books to us too. Live in the moment. Thank God for all of the little things. And this week, as we've been reading in the Today in the Devotionals, we saw how Jacob or Israel had looked back over his life and had said God had been his shepherd all along. And so back through our lives in those times that we don't think we see God, he is there. And I need to remember that too. So this is why this message this morning. How many times have you heard, or have you been told, or have you said yourself, think before you speak or before you do something? That's sort of what I was trying to say to you in the title of today's message. Think. See, you had to do it, didn't you? You had to think. Okay, what's this guy doing? What's, what's with this crazy word here? So. Henry Ford declared, thinking is the hardest work in the world, which is probably why so few people engage in it. In the early years of computer programming, I was going to try to ask Owen if this is still true today, but I remember in the early years, a special word, GIGO, G-I-G-O, was coined and used. Garbage in, garbage out. It just, uh, the computer programmers just said that whatever you put into the program determined what you would get out of it. And it's probably still used among computer programmers today. But what is true of computers is also true of our human mind. Did you know that the average person has 10,000 separate thoughts each day? 10,000. That works out to be something over 3.5 plus million thoughts a year. Now then, what do you think of that? Already most of us have had over 2,000 separate thoughts since we got out of bed this morning. We'll probably have another 8,000 before we hit the sack tonight and then it starts all over again tomorrow. Well, what would you do if you knew for a certain fact that a positive thought and a negative thought cannot occupy the same space in our mind 
at the same time. They cannot coexist at all. If we realized that and thought about that, we would have to start choosing our thoughts as we choose our clothes. Betty Sakali says, two thoughts cannot occupy the mind at the same time. The choice is ours whether or not our thoughts will be constructive or destructive. Every one of those 10,000 thoughts represents a choice that you and I make. A decision to think about this and not about that. I invite you to open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. I will be beginning at verse 4. I know it said I put down 2, uh, 9, but I'm going to start at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. I was rebuked in my spirit this morning about by this verse, because part of the prayer that I was going to pray right after the uh, uh, call to worship. I was going to say several of us, meaning me, are concerned, maybe even worried about Tuesday and the aftermath. And then this verse that is part of our text for today, God says, hey, wait a minute. It says here you're supposed to, every situation, prayer and petition, present your request to God. So I have to be, I have to do that. Anyway, verse 7, And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And verse 9, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Quickly in passing, I'd like us to note these things about that passage. First, we're not to worry about anything, but present our concerns to God in prayer. And as I say, I had this prepared, but this morning I was really concerned, I am concerned about Tuesday, but the verse come, came to mind and the Lord, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you're supposed to present our concerns. Second, verse 7 and verse 9 make a sandwich, if you will, for verse 8. The bread is the peace of God and the God of peace. Verse 8 is the good stuff in the sandwich. Third, we are to think in verse 8 and we are to do or be doers in verse 9. Isn't it James that says, don't be just hearers of the word only, but be doers? Alexander McLaren, a Scotch preacher, asks three questions about verse 8. First, what's the counsel given? The answer is, think on these things. Second, why is this counsel given? The answer, thoughts mold our actions. We become what we think about. Third, how is this precept best obeyed? Answer, by obeying another command of Paul in Colossians chapter 3. Set your mind 
on things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Also, recognize that these things are all embodied in the person of Jesus Christ. J.B. Phillips, in his paraphrase of this passage, starts the verse with what we have as the end. Think on these things. Let's do that. The verb think is a command. It's present tense, meaning that we are continually, all the time, to do it. Think on these things, or as the margin of the revised version has it, take account of. Let these be the consideration which guides our thoughts and, our direct, and directs our motives. I think if you look at this, the Apostle is implying that we have the power of governing our thoughts and we are also responsible for them. If the thoughts are ordered well, the outward life will follow. Serious thinking is an aggressive, determined, concentrated effort. Alistair Begg says this, the Christian will have no problem thinking seriously once the Christian gets around to, think, to seriously thinking. The Christian will have no problem thinking seriously once the Christian gets around to seriously thinking. How is your, how is my thought life? Using this list that's in verse 8, ask these questions about our thoughts or to filter them. First, is it true? Think on or about whatever is true. Knox translates this phrase as all that rings true. Do our words, do our thoughts have the ring of truth about them? Skeptics may deny the existence of absolute truth. Men may scoffingly ask, what is truth? Truth is real and it's found in Christ Jesus, the truth. Second, is it noble? Think on whatever is noble. This refers to which is majestic, awe-inspiring, uplifting. Do you, do you, do I ponder things that are noble and serious purpose? Or do we dwell on the frivolous, the trivial? Third, is it right? Think on or about whatever things are right. Now this means in conformity to God's sight, God's standards. Not is it right in my eyes, is it right in the eyes of others? Is it right in God's eyes? This means not making our decisions on the basis of what is expedient or convenient but we're to ask of every decision we have in our journey of life, what's the right thing to do? That always should be our first question. You can ask what is helpful, what's meaningful, what's gratifying, all of those, but only after we have asked what is the right thing to do. J.B. Phillips says here on this, if you believe in goodness, and if you value the approval of God. Fourth, is it pure? Think on or about whatever is pure. The word means undefiled or chaste and clean, holy. It touches the whole area of our morality. We used to say, Get your mind out of the gutter. If you live in the gutter, don't be surprised that your mind is covered with slime. So is our thought life clean? The phrase, in the world but not of it, really applies here with this, because we are in the world but 
with being morally pure, we are not of the world. There are plenty of occasions round about us that forces the impure upon our notice. And McLaren says, unless you shut your door fast and double lock it, those things will come in. We won't be able to avoid everything. If you read literature, it's impossible to stand back from the thoughts of an alien world. But the way in which we read it distinguishes us from our friends. We recoil from it rather than rejoice in it. And we rebuke every inclination in our hearts to go down that road. Fifth, is it lovely? Think on or think about whatever is lovely. It literally means love towards. It has the idea of attracting loveliness as a magnet attracts iron filings. Do our thoughts automatically attach themselves to what is beautiful and lovely? We're not talking about architecture or fine vases. We're talking about lovely thoughts and, and thinking about Christ. A thought may be true, may even be right, but it still may not be lovely. It may be completely true that apart from Charlie Brown, my brother is the worst blockhead in the world. That may be true, but that's not lovely to call him that. Here's a simple rule. If it's not lovely, if it doesn't make you look lovely, don't say it. Don't think it. Don't do it. Don't dwell on it. Don't be it. Incidentally, some of you will say, well, I didn't know Dale had a brother. He doesn't, but I had to have an illustration for some of about being blind. Sixth, is it admirable? Think on or about whatever is admirable. That is, is it worthy of study and contemplation? Or is it cheap and sleazy? This question asks us to focus on the things that are positive and not negative. Constructive, not destructive. Things that build up, not the things that tear down. Your thoughts matter. Negative thinking leads to negative living. And I think for myself at least, I can't speak for you, but for myself at least, it's been very, very hard during this political campaign not to get negative one time or another. All of the negatives that we keep seeing on the TV there, it, uh, it's hard not to do that. We focus on negative things, it weakens our belief. It gets us believing stuff that isn't true. That not only erodes our faith, it actually will increase fear in our lives. And a life lived in bondage to fear is a life being destroyed. You've heard it. If you, can't, if you think you can't, you probably won't. If you think angry thoughts, angry words soon will follow. If you dwell on your problems, they will soon overwhelm you. Again, people, what goes in must come out. Sooner or later, your thoughts translate into reality. Some things may be true, but that doesn't mean we should dwell on them. Paul in Ephesians 5, verse 12, says there are certain things that are so evil that it's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. Of these six questions, the first two describe the subjects of devout thought as they are in themselves. The next two represent or talk about practical life, relate to practical life. The last two are a moral approval or assent to holiness stimulated in good men. Imagine for a moment, if you will, this scenario. 
Paul is busy dictating these principles. Whatever is true, whatever is honest, he's dictating those to the secretary. And he's on a roll. He's just got all these things that keep coming out. But he stops a moment, looks at his secretary and says, there's so many more that I could list, but I think we could use a catch-all phrase. Something like, if there's any virtue and if there's any praise, think on these things. And he asks his secretary, what do you think about that? The secretary says, that's a good idea. So that makes the next and the last two questions for us to consider. Seven, is it morally excellent? And eight, is it something of which God would uh, approve or which is praiseworthy? Here's a section of the Bible that virtually is comprehensive in relationship to our behavior and minds, actions and thoughts. Check each action, check each thought against this list. How should we behave? How should we treat one another? What should drive us or move us? And here's one I thought of just yesterday, and it's a big one in itself. How do we spend time with social media such as Facebook? I think you agree with me that this is a big one all in itself. What do I allow to enter my mind through this source? What should my morality be? What about the things I read, my books, my magazines? It should, I should ask this question or these questions about how I decide what to watch, what movies or videos or plays or TV productions. Can I go to this place this evening or this weekend or on vacation? Check each of these things against this list. It's a call to each of us to live in the realm of the real versus the phony. The serious, not the frivolous. The right, not the convenient. The clean, not the dirty. The loving, not the discordant the helpful, not the critical. In short, it is a reminder to us that we are supposed to be like Jesus. I was hoping that we would have the hymn in our hymnal, Earthly Pleasures Being the Calling. Uh, I think the actual title is I Would Be Like Jesus, but I could not find it. And I didn't want to try to do another posting. So I'll just read the words of that hymn. Earthly pleasures vainly call me. I would be like Jesus. Nothing worldly shall enthrall me. I would be like Jesus. The refrain or the chorus is, Be like Jesus, this my song, In the home and in the throng. Be like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus. He has broken every fetter. I would be like Jesus, that my soul may serve him better. I would be like Jesus, that in heaven he may meet me. I would be like Jesus, that his words well done may greet me. I would be like Jesus. If you fill your mind with these things, things that are true, noble, and virtuous, there can't be, there won't be any room for worry or thoughts that are anxiety-producing, peace-disturbing, or joy-destroying. Focus on these things, you will have the peace of God. These eight questions point the way towards positive thinking, the King James Version of Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What you think today, you become tomorrow. 
Your mind is the best predictor of your future. You and I can literally change our minds if we want to. How? By remembering that all that is best is embodied in a person and I speak of Jesus Christ. It's all in Him. All virtue, all beauty, all holiness, all truth, all that is good and right is found in Him. He is the truth. He is the most noble Son of God. He is the standard of righteousness. He's the fountain of purity. He's altogether lovely. He's the admirable Savior. He is the source of all virtue. He is the one to whom God entirely approves. Think on these things. Let us pray, please. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. It's practical, it's relevant, it's challenging. Thank you that you give it to us with such clarity. You love us so wonderfully. You long for us, your children, to be marked by maturity, by grace. Father, fill our minds with the truth of your word. Don't let us become boring volumes of theology, but let us become sermons that are joyful, truthful, noble, admirable. Receive our praise and our worship. Our closing hymn is number 351.
God the Father, the love of Jesus the Son, and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest upon each of us now and forevermore.